in Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, well-known passage, but uh, uh, as you are turning there, uh, every once in a while, sometimes we have to fill out some paperwork, it gets rather annoying, and uh, aggravating sometimes long, drawn-out things, you send it in, they send it back. The following letter is from a professional bricklayer, uh, and it was in response to his workers' compensation claim for injuries that were sustained on the job. It seems that uh, the uh, state workers' comp needed more detailed information for an accident investigation about how the bricklayer sustained substantial injuries. Here is his, that is the bricklayer's, letter. Dear Sir, I am writing in response to your request for additional information in Block 3 of the Accident Report Form Part 1. I put in that block poor planning as the cause of my accident. You ask for more explanation, and I trust the following details will be sufficient. I'm a bricklayer by trade. On the day of the accident, I was working alone on the roof of a new six-story building. When I completed the work, I found that I had some bricks left over, which, uh, when weighed later, were found to be slightly in excess of 500 pounds. Rather than carry the bricks down by hand, I decided to lower them in a barrel by using a pulley, which was attached to the side of the building at the sixth floor. Securing the rope at the ground level, I went up to the roof, swung the barrel out, loaded the bricks into it. Then I went back down and untied the rope, holding onto the rope very tightly, to ensure a slow descent of the bricks. You'll note in block 11 of part 1 of the accident report form that I only weigh 135 pounds. <laughs> Due to my surprise at being jerked off the ground so suddenly, I lost my the presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. Needless to say, I proceeded upwards at a rapid rate on the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel, which was now proceeding downward at an equally impressive speed. This explains the fractured skull, minor abrasions, broken collarbone, as listed in Section 3 of Part 2, Accident Report Form. Uh, slowed only slightly, I continued my rapid ascent, not stopping until the fingers of my right hand were two knuckles deep into the pulley. <laughs> Fortunately, by this time I regained my presence of mind, was able to hold on to the rope in spite of the excruciating pain that I was now beginning to experience. At approximately the same time, however, the barrel of bricks hit the ground and the bottom fell out of the barrel. <laughs> now to avoid the weight of the bricks, the barrel weighed approximately 50 pounds. I refer to you once again that my weight was 135. <laughs> As you might imagine, I began a rapid descent down the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel coming up. <laughs> this accounts for the two fractured angles broken to <laughs> severe lacerations of my legs and lower body. <laughs> Here my luck began to change only slightly. The encounter with the barrel seemed to slow me enough to lessen my injuries when I fell on the pile of bricks on the ground. Fortunately, only three vertebrae were cracked. <laughs> I am sorry to report, however, that as I lay there on the pile of bricks, I once again, in my pain, let go of the rope. <laughs> and lay there watching the empty barrel come down on top of me. That explains two broken legs. <laughs> I hope that this answers your inquiry as to my poor planning. <laughs> I think there's a little more poor planning in Boston. So sometimes you're just having a bad day. You ask, what does that have to do with uh, our text? Yeah, absolutely nothing. But it cracked me up there. thought you didn't know
<laughs> Everybody needed a good life tonight. You yeah. got it. <laughs> we'll, we'll get you a copy afterwards. Oh, oh the worst thing about that sounded like it could have been the truth. <laughs> I had met guys that are this
This requires a new life, the life of a growing disciple. And the church is what God has given um, to develop those disciples. So Jesus summarizes the commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Love the Lord with all your being. The core of our relationship with the Lord is a love relationship because he first loved you. It's not that you and I first loved him. He loved us. That He demonstrated his love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, still dead in our sins, he died for us. People, uh, however, <coughs> act as if life is all about us. It's all up to us. You know, we struggle to preserve ourselves, to protect our lives, to promote ourselves, to provide for ourselves, and then pat ourselves on the back. Psychologists say that the highest human need is uh, something called self-actualization. Studied psychology in college, and I still never figured out exactly what they're really talking about. It sounds like a bunch of mumbo-jumbo to me. <laughs> but that's what it's all about, the self. To, to have gotten it all and have it all under our control. We need to be our own God. To meet our own physical and emotional needs without God. That's what self-actualization really is. The Lord and the Bible say that our purpose is to love the Lord our God. Something uh, that's very different than what the natural man says. We don't need to preserve ourselves, protect ourselves, promote ourselves, provide our, for ourselves, and pat ourselves on the back. We depend on God for those things. For our daily bread, for our very life, for our very substance, we depend on God. And something supernatural, life-transforming, and otherwise impossible happens for those who love the Lord supremely. Love God this way, and you will be transformed. He says that we can love Him with all of our, our hearts. That we can have in God a satisfaction that fills up uh, everything that our life needs. Those very things that people find to be so elusive can be found in Christ. The vacuum that nothing else can fill, Jesus can fill that. The cross-shaped void in our lives. The meaning and the significance that comes from being a child of God is ours as we love Him so totally. And to love Him with our soul. That is, uh, the soul is a place where some, uh, our will exists, our, our willful choice you know, that we love Him even when we don't feel like it. Even when we're not sure about things. And when Eve sinned and they ran from God, but we have the opportunity to turn to Him and love Him. Uh, to trust and to obey, even when our emotions say something different. Like extending uh, help to those who are in need. And to extend praise to God, even when we don't feel like it. Sometimes... Uh, I was listening to Michael Youssef for a few minutes this past week, and sometimes, you know, when we uh, are so down, we need to just start praising God, and we need to just start telling the devil, devil, you can't touch me. I'm a child of God, and nothing can change that. No one can separate me from his love. And we need to stand and praise God and be vocal about it and, and take these uh, promises of Scripture and just repeat them back as praise to God. A willful choice. And love God that way. To love Him with our heart, soul, and mind. Knowledge, and wisdom, and insight for living as we trust His truth. Actively thinking about Him. There are many who will love God with their emotions, but can we love God with our minds? And fill our minds, and, and utilize our minds to, to know God better, and to understand His ways better, and to communicate others better, and glorify and give honor to Him, serve Him and witness Him, uh, witness of Him uh, through even loving Him in our minds, relying on God, not on ourselves, walking according to the Spirit, and not according to the sin nature, being changed. Love the Lord your God with all your being. And that's the first and greatest commandment, Jesus says. And there's a reason why that is the first and 
and greatest command. Probably more than one reason, but for uh, the thought that we have here uh, in this passage, you know, it, it's getting at the very core of how we can be the people God wants us to be and experience that, that supernatural transforming, otherwise impossible experience of being a child of God as we love God with all of our heart because that frees us to love our neighbor as ourselves. This requires, this loving neighbor as self, requires a choice and a commitment and a practical application. At some point, it's going to uh, come down to a practical application. Love, as God designed it, means helping others spiritually and physically. In James, it talks about uh, if we see someone that doesn't have clothing and doesn't have the food that they need, and it's cold, and, and, and they're hungry, and, and they don't know where else to turn, to not be that uh, believer that says, oh, go, I wish you well, be warm and filled. But to actually uh, do something about their needs. We have that opportunity, and of course we try to do that through our community supper and, and other ministries. And we encounter that and help those. In uh, 1 John, it talks about you know, having that love in us that uh, displays the fact that we do love God. The one who doesn't love other people, um, their relationship with God comes into question. But agape love gives. People want to usually be takers, our natural self is to be takers, but love gives. We need to help others be saved and be discipled so that God's truth operates in their lives. Well, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. We've covered that. Love your neighbor as yourself. We've touched on that. There's lots of examples in the scripture that Jesus gave us, examples of how to do that. There's examples of the uh, disciples, of uh, the apostles in the early church doing that, reaching out to those who were uh, in need. You know, you, you look at... Uh, uh, Pentecost, and you see a great spiritual explosion, but, but pay attention to what follows in some of the later chapters, that people who had needs, that the church met those needs, that there were those who had physical needs and they were healed. There were people who had uh, material needs and, and their needs were met. Uh, when the uh, widows were not receiving the, the service that they needed to, they, they formed a group of spiritual Guys, to oversee it and make sure that their needs were met. Very practical, loving neighbor as self. You see that then continue uh, in the church throughout the New Testament. In fact, there was one lady. Uh, she used to use her uh, sewing uh, abilities to make clothes for those who were widows. When she died, it just broke up everybody in the whole community. They were all broken hearted for the loss of one who had been so loving to use that gift and, and skill. That uh, they were fortunate that. Uh, Peter showed up and took care of that situation. Loving others. But then there's this third part. Love your neighbor as yourself. 20 years of ministry, I can count on one hand and have about four fingers left over. The number of times I've heard anybody preach this passage and say much of anything about that phrase as yourself. Because I think, I surmise that uh, the self loving self part is tricky, so tricky that many skip it altogether because it is deemed in uh, to be a self lover, a selfish. <coughs> when we start talking about loving yourself, all these images uh, pop up um, that we were actually. Um, talking about something very different than what Jesus meant when he mentioned here. So what might he mean? Self-love is deemed as the problem, but we are actually created to care about ourselves and to present ourselves as a workman approved before God. There are some things that we should invest in ourselves, but we have to get the priority right. If we think about it, um, the loving neighbor part, loving other neighbor, and considering the needs of others as more important, important than our own, Philippians chapter 2. Uh, John Piper says this actually uh, presents a subtle threat to a lot of people. A lot of people think that if you love your 
neighbor in this way, this sacrificial way, uh, that it's a threat that maybe somehow our own needs aren't going to be met. If, if I really get serious about loving, maybe I'm not going to get the food, I'm not going to get the clothing, I'm not going to get the shelter that I need. If I put someone else ahead of me, my needs might get neglected. But this is why loving God is the uh, greatest commandment. Because if we understand, loving God means trusting that he will take care of my needs. He will see to it that I have my needs met. Jesus said, look at the fields, you know. They're clothed with such beauty and splendor. Solomon didn't even look so nice. Consider the birds of the air. You know, they, they aren't out there struggling and striving. They're, God takes care of them. Are you not more important than it? God's going to take care. God's going to meet your needs. And we can love, if we love God first and supremely and foremost, we are free to love others and free to sacrifice for the gospel. And free for kingdom ministries. Because we know God is going to take care of us. And we can uh, understand that our needs will be met. If we keep the right priority. Jesus, others, and you is the priority. Jesus, others, and you. And if you take the first letter from each one of those words, you get the word joy. Jesus, others, and you. God does not call us to neglect or uh, practice some type of self-harm. Rather, when he says that we are to love others, it is as ourselves. It is we are free to love other people and to do for them and, and to make those sacrifices and to give to missions and to spend time in ministries and to take time off and do mission trips and all those kinds of things. We're free to do that. Because we know, since we love God first and foremost, that he's going to meet all of our needs. And there is a healthy kind of self-respect uh, that the Bible does lift up to us. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The commandment to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and to love neighbor as yourself. The issue then is pride versus Christ likeness. Is it all going to be about the self? And, and that's what I was talking about initially when I said people act as though uh, it's all up to us to preserve, protect, promote, provide for ourselves. But it isn't when we surrender to Christ and we love Him as the Lord of our life. The whole problem with the wrong kind of self-love is pride. That's why it even bothers us to talk about it sometimes. Oh, I'm going to love myself. That, that would be prideful or adoration of self. And we know that pride goes before the fall. And, and we know that pride caused the fall. And pride is rebellion before God. And self-promoting uh, people use other people. And they destroy other people. And it's unhealthy to be a pride-filled person. Physically, emotionally, and spiritually unhealthy. But love for God destroys that pride at the root. When our desire is to honor God, glorify Him, and obey Him, uh, when we love Jesus and we, uh, we love His commands, we're going to obey Him, that reorders who we are. It reprograms our thinking. It redesigns our purpose and our intention. And it transforms who we are. Then we can see the value of others. And we understand the, the condition of those without Christ. And how uh, it is definitely worth our time, worth our effort to sacrifice, to give our time and our money and our prayers and our efforts and our words of witness and testimony to see them come to know Jesus. The root of sin is pride. Love God, love others, and self in the right order. Have the joy with Jesus, others, and you. And you discover that God is the source of this new life. This life that doesn't have to be um, 
trapped in pride. The uh, way to be free and have a healthy view is seeing who we are in Christ. Sinners, absolutely. But we are forgiven, saved, justified, redeemed, and on our way to glory because we are children of God who are deeply loved. And we can see ourselves in that light as children of God that God so loved that he lavished his love on us yeah, that we can have the right kind of respect for ourselves as we love our neighbor. But more than anything else, we love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. And there's a world out there that is hungry for this. They don't need to be scrounging through the trash cans of this world and existing on the scraps. We don't need to see uh, those who are losing uh, their lives while they try to gain the world, only to find out in the end that they'll be empty. They don't need to be lost for eternity. They need Jesus. And they need a church to love them and to tell them, to win them, and then to disciple them. To disciple them in what the greatest commandment is. To love God because He is worth it. And it is a joy and it is a good thing to love Him that way. Perfectly, that totally, at least as good as we can in this life, and then to be able to do that uh, perfectly in the next. And to uh, be free to love our neighbor, to meet their needs, to, to know Jesus, and then even to have that sense uh, that we are the beloved of God, and that His banner over us is love. That we are more than conquerors in him who loved us. And to see us, see ourselves in Christ as the children of God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. In other words, the Old Testament is divided into three parts. Law, prophets, and wisdom. And so he mentions two of them, and he's saying, really, that this is what the Bible's been talking about. This is what we've been trying to tell you, the Father and I, and Jesus is saying to these Pharisees. This is the point you need to take away from it. Love him totally, and watch it transform your life. Lord, thank you for your work tonight, and thank you that you loved us.